Welcome back. Tracy Corbett Lynch is a sister of Jason Corbett, who was killed in North Carolina in 2015. His second wife, Molly Martins, and her father, Tom Martins, were found guilty of his murder before their convictions were overthrown in 2021, and a retrial is now pending. Yes, and Tracy joins us now to chat about her memoir on dealing with grief. Good morning to you, and thank you so much. I know you were saying you're, you're really nervous and you don't like doing this, so thank you so much for being here. And we're looking at the book, thank you. Loss and What It Taught Me About Living. And you are here, you're living your life. And, I mean, you have been through so much, and, of course, about Jason's very public um, murder and what you had to go through. Can you tell us about hearing of it and how you dealt with it? I think, it, like with grief, and, and really there's no two griefs that, you know, we experience the very same, and all of us, how I would experience grief and information, it'd be very different to how you would, Alan, or, or you would, Mirren. So um, it was it was really difficult, and it was obviously so public as well mm. um, to experience it, and you, you feel such a sense of powerlessness and um, you feel lost and struggle and wonder why this has happened to you. But, you know, we were very lucky. We had, you know, some wonderful people in our lives and, and so much support as well mm. um, with people that really rallied around us. So that helped a lot. Yeah. And, and this morning, like Sarah, Jason's youngest daughter is here with us today and Sarah's fantastic, so vocal, like she's really justice for Jason is, is what she lives in. And you're, you do speak very openly about it, but I think your world must have been turned upside down because I know that there was a visceral reaction by the public in Ireland to the overturning of the convictions for Molly and Tom Martins for, for the murder of Jason. They're facing retrial again. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, I mean, we're doing okay now. We're taking it one day at a time, but we had spent so many years, you know, rebuilding our lives and, you know, seeking support and um, talk therapy and professional help and, you know, and looking and really being introspective and finding ways and how to heal and, you know, how do you come to terms with something like this? And we, we had done so much work and obviously it was such a shock. Um, when the convictions were overturned and a retrial mm. was granted. And it, it's very much like, you know, the Jenga game where you've we'd all these building blocks of our lives that we'd rebuilt a different life as a new family. And, it, you know, it's like somebody comes along and just takes that bottom piece and everything comes falling down all around us. And it was an extremely difficult time for all of us individually and collectively. But you know what? We took some time and... Um, we, you know, we stood back a little bit and, and realised that all of those pieces and what we had done, you know, to help ourselves heal were still there. So, you know, we're, we're very resilient and we gathered ourselves together and we have each other as well. You know, we're a very open and, yeah. and close family and we do talk. To help each um, other. Uh, to help each other. It's incredibly important to be honest and, and open. Was there an anger there? Because I'm sure I've, that happened. I, I, think, I think the overwhelming thing for me would be anger at the system for allowing that to happen. I, I felt, and in the book, I, I definitely, you know, there, you feel so many different emotions in, in grief and, and not in, I talk about, you know, the, the five stages of grief and I don't really agree that there's any particular stages at any particular time, yeah. but um, certainly there's anger, there's every emotion that you feel, but what's important is, you know, recognising and for us, the fact that, you know, while you do feel powerless, you know, and, and it's really senseless, you know, what happened to Jason. But equally, you know, you have to accept, and that's the difficult thing, that we don't have control over certain things in our lives. And it's yeah. to come to terms with that mm. and try to live in the present time. And I always try to teach that to the kids. And, you know, we look at focusing on today and, and what we can do today. If I looked ahead, you know, I know that... There's a hearing in November, there is a hearing in January, there is a hearing on March 17th. There's a pre-trial hearing in early June and the retrial is on the 26th of June. So, you know, if, if you focus on, on those things, you know, you're, you're not living. Um, you know, you're just looking forward all the time. And, mm. you know, life, when we're lucky to have it, is about 
being here and being present and being with you guys this morning, yeah. which is a pleasure. Yeah. I, I do I do find them, you know, challenging to do interviews, but it's it's really important. I think grief, um, you know, is something that comes to all of us, and it's not something that we talk about enough. I feel. Um, and in my book, it's about my experience, yeah. you know, what I did to help me um, through, you know, the losses in my life, not just Jason, yeah. you know, but it's, it's what I did. And I hope it provides some some comfort um, to people. I think it's fascinating there what you said, obviously, in the in the top of your mind, the dates are there, like it's the birthdays mm. of your children. They're yeah. right there. Yeah. But you want to live your life and the way you're speaking with Sarah sitting right there and it's and it's her dad. You do talk about everything. Everything is in the open. Nothing's nothing's off limits. So that's that's kind of amazing because you've got, you know, you've got four kids now. You've got Jack and Sarah, obviously, who came into your family as children when they came home from from the US. So how was that? Because almost in your mind, it must be the welfare of your now four children. Jack and Sarah were our priority, and yeah. obviously our other two children. Um, and we had spent initially the first two years of uh, when Jack and Sarah came to live with us. I mean, we didn't talk about everything. We listened a lot. And, you know, there were things that we had to be very conscious of that Jack and Sarah, you know, had been uprooted from a life. Yeah. And uh, um, like, you know, and we loved them. So, you know, we, we didn't ask questions. We listened more than we asked. And uh, very much with children had chosen in their behaviour as well. So that was important and to provide them with security and love um, and try to rebuild trust in adults, which they had lost completely. So after the convictions in 2017 and as the kids grew, obviously we had gone to so much and we did a really good job protecting them. I, think Sarah and Jack would agree from, you know, everything that was out there, mm. that actually it had become really difficult after that for them, I'm sure, um, to be aware of what was out there. You know, I mean, they know their own lives, but um, we worked together as a family. We did normal things. We went back to kind of what my parents would have done. We had dinner together and, you know, if somebody wanted to talk to each other privately, Sarah's always good and like, they'd leave a note and we'd go and find somewhere quiet, you know, to have a chat. But we tried like it was, if it's like singing in the sitting room and, you know, before this had happened, you'd never find me dancing around the kitchen. If a song came on, Sarah can show you some TikToks <laughs> now that aren't public. Um, <laughs> She's you nodding know, over yeah, there going, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I've got them in my yeah, bag. Yeah, that you but just have to embrace when, because yeah. life Patricia, can be have pretty to move bad. On. Like you have to move on. And I know there was, there was, I was looking at some pictures in here and you were sort of saying, oh, I, I even felt guilty for looking good that day taking a selfie. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it does, you you know, and that was a time where you actually have to really look deeply into yourself. And, you know, Jason didn't want to die. Megs didn't want to die. My mother didn't want to. People don't want to die. But I don't believe they want us to go on feeling, you know, really horrible yeah. about ourselves either. You know, I know that if any of them were here, they'd be, you know, living life because that's what they were life like. Mm -hmm. You know, they loved life and they wanted to embrace it. So, yeah, there's really difficult moments in that. But you're right. We have to move mm. forward. I wouldn't say move on. I live with grief. It doesn't live in me. Yeah. It lives alongside me. And certainly, you know, after June 2023, I look forward to moving forward, forward. and not be, you know, really a victim to the meat grinder that is the judicial system. Sarah has spent half of her life living under the judicial system, yeah. you know, yeah. they don't, they need, you know, victims, you know, need to be able to live their life. Um, and Jack and Sarah and our children all need to be able yeah. to move forward with their lives. Completely. So that's what I'm hopeful for. I, you know, Adam and Dean are involved in this as well. But yeah. there's there's one thing you you mentioned Mags there. Yeah, it's Jason's Jason's yeah. wife. Yeah. And um, Sarah's Sarah and Jack's mom. And you keep their memory alive. Like there's pictures of them all around the house. Yeah, absolutely. When when Jason left to move to America, he had 
left, you know, two suitcases from Mags's wedding dress. And, you know, they were all left before he went and wanted to make sure that he had this time capsule of everything from, I have a monster hat from when Mags and Jay and I and David went over to Baritz, you know, you know, yeah. many years ago. And we actually took the suitcase. monster were really good. Yeah, they lost that time, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, okay. um, But yeah, and they are amazing. But, and we had followed them all over Europe, both of us as couples, you know, but we took out that suitcase only a couple of months ago and Sarah and I and we'd set in the landing of our house and I don't know why we took it out. Sometimes, you know, you just dig back in a little bit, it reconnects you and um, I had found a bottle of aftershave inside it and completely forgot that it was a bottle of aftershave that um, Mags had gifted Jason when they were dating and he wore it all the time, like and all through his life and continued to wear it. I just love that you sprayed it on the I stairs. I, yeah. I, I sprayed it yeah. and it was just, it pervaded, you know, everything and like felt, we felt his closeness. It was bittersweet as well. Yeah. Um, but they're lovely yeah, memories lovely and memories, it's, like... it's nice to have those. So we try to focus now on, you know, on, on the memories of them because for some time, some time during grief, I feel like for me, I get disconnected, you know, from the person, you know, and with Jason in particular, trying to see past so much that we'd been yeah. exposed to. Yeah. It took a long time to reconnect and, and now I can recall him and, you know, and the, the look and the feel of the hug and those, those like lovely, that. Again. Those lovely memories. I mean, you're, you're, you, it comes across that you're such a close knit family and your mother was your rock yeah. and then she passed at the start of COVID. That must have been devastating for you. Yeah, I th we thought really, you know, we couldn't cope with it anymore, really. And um, Meg's, or my my mother um, had contracted COVID and she was the fulcrum of our, our family. She's what knitted us all together. And I had um, stopped working in January of the year. She passed away in May 2020. And I got to spend the five or six months beforehand with her, sitting on the bed and chatting with her and having the cups of tea and really, you know, reigniting that very close mother-daughter relationship. And, you know, it's one of, it was a diff difficult decision to stop working but it was the best decision I ever made. And I think you never regret those things. No. Those decisions you make for people that yeah. you love and the, the value of that is something, it's something I'd always say, yeah. you know, if there's something you, you want to do, do it now, you know, and just value the moments that you have because they can change so quickly. Mm. They really can, you know, in 2015, I was in France, you know, we were looking at a holiday home where Dave and I were going to retire to and a phone call changed everything. You know, and, you know, we had to go through so much, but I am living a wholesome life. I don't want people to feel sorry for me or, you know, I'm blessed to have, you know, Mags and Jason and my mother in my in my life. I don't feel like it's a burden. Grief can feel like a burden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm very lucky with the people I've had. I think it's beautiful what you just said there about mm. living and the things that you don't regret, spending time with the people that you've loved and you've experienced loss that a lot of us will never ever thankfully have yeah. in our yeah. lives. Um, the book is called Loss and What It Taught Me About Living and getting to speak to Sarah today, uh, who's with you, she's a testament to you. She's Thank great you. crack. <laughs> uh, she's all about going home. She likes sitting down with her mammy and, and watching movies, not going, out the, not going out in the tear in Limerick and Angel Lane. <laughs> and uh, so the book is uh, out now. It's there, Tracy Corbett Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank morning. You Thank you so much. Pleasure.